David, uh, Joel, Kennedy, I'm not sure where you are, and I know Michelle is here. Let's get started. Um, I know there's an event at uh, USIP um, at 2 o'clock with Salva Kier that I think a number of uh, people here are trying to get to, and so we want to end a little bit before 2 to give people time to get over there, and we need to clear out of this room pretty promptly before 2. Um, so let's uh, bring the panel up here. Kennedy? Well, uh, listen, I just want to say a really big thanks to um, uh, this morning's panel. I think those were two sets of really excellent in-depth discussions with people who are really really immersed in these issues and really were able to give a level of texture and detail to these big challenges. Um, just remarkable. And I want to thank once again our panelists really for uh, coming so far to spend today with us. Uh, really, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, it's been extremely helpful. And I do want to say, I, I omitted this morning to say thanks to uh, Joel Barkin, um, who did a lot of arm twisting on this, I think, in calling in personal favors to get such a high quality uh, panel uh, put together. So thanks again. Uh, let's move to this panel where we're talking about U.S. engagement uh, on Kenya in the run-up to the referendum and now moving forward. And we're delighted to have with us um, today Michelle Gavin, who's a special assistant to the president and senior director for African Affairs at the NSC, National Security Council. Uh, Michelle is a long-time uh, Africanist, was engaged uh, with probably one of our most active senators, uh, S uh, Senator um, Feingold, uh, who uh, active on Africa on the Hill for many years, um, and uh, a very keen a, a interest uh, in, in Kenya as well. Uh, U.S. engagement, I think, in this last period has been uh, proactive, energetic, and I think really reflects U.S. interests in Kenya, which are in some ways more mature and probably more broad than they are uh, in much of Africa, I think. I think it also reflects the personal interests of, of President Barack Obama. Uh, partly it has to do with his family tree, but I think equally uh, probably by a sense of optimism about Kenya, optimism and ex expectation. I think you really can't spend time in Kenya without being struck by the pol incredible political energy, uh, the wealth of thoughtful, forward-thinking intellectuals and analysts. We've had a great sampling of that here today. Um, and uh, th who have been really voices over decades now for political reform, uh, political openness, and, um, and uh, uh, kind of countervailing voices within Kenyan society. Um, so we heard this morning, I think, a, a lot about the challenges ahead. And while this, there are a lot of celebration around the referendum, uh, which is, you know, well-warranted celebration, given that just two years ago, uh, Kenya was going through such a deep and uh, vituperative um, crisis, um, a, but a lot of challenges ahead. And while the referendum, there are certain lessons we can draw from that, the stakes will be much higher, uh, it, the, the issues much more complex uh, in the coming national election. And, and then again, the, the, the Constitution addressed, uh, which, which was intended to address some very sp specific political problems within Kenya, um, that will face challenges logistic and, and political of its own, uh, with strong vested interests still at play, uh, and so forth. So I'm going to turn to Michelle first to talk about U.S. engagement uh, at this time. Michelle has been at the center of really mobilizing this pretty remarkable uh, uh, U.S. commitment uh, to seeing this uh, Constitution through. Uh, to keeping Kenya really high on the radar screen despite major crises going on in Somalia next door, uh, in Sudan, and then on the, in the global world, to have uh, President Obama, Vice President Biden, Secretary Clinton so very engaged on, on Kenya during this, this time is pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, and I think seeing the energy that went behind this constitution 
uh, you couldn't help being a bit enthusiastic about it. And I think one of the questions for U.S. policy is, in some ways, were we perhaps too enthusiastic in, in our support and endorsement for this Constitution? Um, I think there's some, you know, it's, it's a fine line, I think, uh, between uh, supporting a process uh, versus kind of uh, the perception, at least, that we were coming down uh, one way or the other in terms of, of, of the outcome. But I, I'm sure Michelle has heard that question before and um, hope we can address that. So Michelle, I'm going to turn to you for uh, thoughts on the process uh, so far and, and, moving, and U.S. engagement moving forward. Then we'll turn briefly to our panelists for very quick remarks and then open up the floor for discussion. Thanks. And it's a pleasure to be joining you all today. I'm sorry that I didn't have the benefit of uh, hearing from the panel earlier because I've, I've heard uh, nothing but great things about it and it, it sounds um, it sounds like it's been a very insightful session uh, thus far. Uh, so with that sort of disadvantage and in injecting myself into an ongoing conversation, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be quite brief because what's interesting is always the, the give and take. But in terms of how this administration has looked at Kenya since taking office, and when the Obama administration uh, <coughs> uh, took office, we were um, keenly aware of the stakes in Kenya, the, the memories of uh, early 2008 is still uh, very, very vivid for the administration and a sense uh, of um, urgency around not allowing the situation to, to uh, deteriorate in, in the way that we saw before and a, a real fear that uh, another round of violence like that would be uh, uh, that much more difficult for Kenya to, to pull itself back from the brink. So there was uh, a sense of, of urgency and worry about return to crisis. But I would say that there was also a, a very keen sense of potential. Uh, you know, having seen what Kenyans themselves were able to do uh, to pull the country back from the brink, the uh, mobilization and coordination and cohesion that we saw uh, in civil society and parts of the Kenyan private sector, uh, and the, the kind of leadership there, combined with some interesting indicators of generational change in the Kenyan political system, uh, also, I, I think, for a lot of us, gave a sense of um, there's opportunity here. There's some uh, important and interesting Kenyan partners uh, to work with moving forward. And so uh, with that kind of immediate sense of, of where the dynamics were in Kenya and then, of course, the, uh, the set of reasons that every U.S. administration has had to care about Kenya, the fact that it's um, uh, been historically one of our strongest partners on the continent and on a wealth of critical issues uh, of surrounding regional security, uh, humanitarian access for the region writ large, uh, Kenya has been uh, an absolutely essential partner, and certainly the depth of our relationship with Kenya is uh, almost unique uh, on the continent. Uh, the, uh, the scope of ties, the sheer number of uh, Kenyan students uh, who study in the U.S., the um, robust Peace Corps program, the, this is a, a longstanding relationship that we value for multiple reasons. Uh, and so when we kind of looked at uh, sub-Saharan Africa at the very beginning, you had your very obvious hot spots and crisis points, uh, Sudan, Somalia certainly, uh, uh, and others, but you also had these two regionally essential states uh, on, on either side of the continent, Nigeria and Kenya, where you uh, had seen uh, recently some uh, alarming trajectories and where we believed we needed to focus a great deal of attention uh, right from the start. <coughs> we also had some interesting assets to bring to bear in, uh, in trying to ensure that uh, we were giving it all we've got to uh, strengthen the U.S.-Kenyan relationship and, in, in fact, uh, create conditions conducive to uh, greater Kenyan stability. And uh, the the most obvious asset being, of course, the President of the United States, uh, whose knowledge uh, of Kenya is uh, quite considerable and extensive, whose interest is keen. I, I can assure you that the questions 
I got from day one uh, on Kenya uh, coming from the West Wing were um, tough questions and, uh, and obviously extraordinarily well informed. And he does have a unique degree of um, influence, perhaps, uh, uh, or soft power. Uh, on the continent uh, writ large, and certainly I think in Kenya. So that's a tremendous asset. But I, I would also note there's a great asset in having an Assistant Secretary of State uh, in Johnny Carson, who's a, a former uh, U.S. Ambassador to Kenya and who was there during a, a critical time, certainly in Kenya's uh, political development. Um, so uh, in addition to, to caring deeply about Kenya, loving it, loving its people, believing in its potential, he also had uh, relationships with an awful lot of uh, key players that uh, certainly I think help facilitate our diplomatic engagement, obviously uh, working with Ambassador Randenberger and, and, and the team on the ground. So all of this sort of backdrop is to say that we came in thinking, okay, we cannot be uh, sort of asleep at the switch uh, on, on Kenya just because the immediate crisis has passed. Um, we, we actually should be surging forward in, in trying to engage and particularly to promote the reform agenda uh, that was, um, uh, uh, you know, that fourth basket of issues um, identified by, uh, by Kofi Annan and, and his team in trying to facilitate it into the crisis. And so uh, trying to find ways to push forward on reform uh, quite robustly uh, was, was kind of the mantra from the start. And, and we did make a big push. There were some uh, early uh, visits, some early strong public messages uh, where the message uh, that we were sending to uh, Kenyan leadership was, look, there's no business as usual uh, with, uh, with those who, who might be working to obstruct the reform agenda. The stakes are, are far too high. Uh, we, all, we all saw uh, the nature of those stakes uh, during the crisis. And so some very uh, strong signals at the leadership level. But in parallel to that was uh, an effort to reach out and uh, strengthen and support uh, those positive factors that we saw, those uh, sources of tremendous potential. So um, some very robust democracy and governance programming uh, uh, to the tune of uh, over $60 million, uh, which in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya does extremely well. Um, and then also a series of visits uh, over the course of the, the first year and a half of this administration, we had uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, engagement last summer, the summer of uh, 2009, uh, and a, a key uh, element of that w was not just the, the standard kind of bilateral meetings with Kenyan leadership, but the uh, uh, town hall uh, event that she did at the University of Nairobi, uh, reaching out uh, intended to be speaking directly with, engaging with, and getting ideas from Kenyan civil society, Kenyan civil society, and crucially younger Kenyans, and uh, and then Vice President Biden traveling uh, this past summer doing a similar event, um, where his messages were very directly aimed at Kenyan citizens, not necessarily um, specific to uh, Kenyan political leaders. Uh, we also had. Uh, you know, deployed the president's voice in, in different ways. Certainly he's engaged um, with his uh, counterparts uh, in the Kenyan government, but he is also, uh, for example, did an exclusive interview uh, with Kenyan Broadcasting uh, back in June in an, in an effort to try and reach again directly to the Kenyan people. Uh, and so it's true that we have uh, come in for some criticism, a sense that our voices have been uh, perhaps too loud uh, in uh, supporting the reform agenda. Uh, but I think that uh, a close look at where we've been over the course of the last 18 months has made it clear that what our strategy and our effort has never been about uh, trying to promote the reform agenda simply because uh, we believe it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's been much more focused on uh, trying to be uh, supportive of Kenyan civil society and those pull factors uh, from within Kenya that are kind of uh, pulling leadership along in, in uh, ad advancing that agenda and moving forward. Uh, and this is a, it's pretty clear in all the public statements and it's very clearly been part of our approach. Uh, Certainly the uh, $45 million Yes Youth Can initiative that was uh, launched last, I think, December 
uh, is, a, is a tremendously important part of that with this idea that the more that you empower uh, young Kenyans to engage civically, to be a part of the system, uh, and to uh, be able to articulate clearly where it is they want their country to go, uh, the more you're going to uh, see Kenya driving toward a place where it's going to be uh, sustainably stable and have uh, uh, better chances for even more prosperity uh, and growth in, in the years ahead. And the last thing I would just say is that uh, while I do, I do feel very good that we've, uh, we've given it a lot, <laughs> we've given it a lot of effort uh, to try and um, encourage uh, the reform agenda in Kenya, uh, we are, and we were thrilled to see a largely peaceful uh, uh, referendum and very thrilled to see uh, that the aftermath remained peaceful. Uh, we're not under any impression that kind of this work is done and sort of, okay, we can check Kenya off the list of things that we need to do. Far, far from it, it's uh, very clear and this high level engagement has helped make it very clear to senior officials in the U.S. government uh, that there, <laughs> there's a tremendous amount of work to be done. I think uh, for the Vice President when he was engaging uh, with the Reform Caucus of Parliamentarians this past summer in Nairobi, uh, for him to hear from them kind of just how ambitious it would be to, to be moving out on uh, implementing legislation for a new constitution, I think helped give us a real flavor of how much work there is to be done and how important it'll be not to sort of let the sense of exhaustion and relief that I would imagine uh, Kenyan civil society leaders uh, uh, must have felt uh, in the wake of a peaceful referendum, not to let that kind of uh, take hold and, and let momentum sort of dissipate uh, and uh, find ourselves uh, uh, less engaged uh, or certainly uh, Kenyan civil society less prepared for the very, very difficult uh, days to come. So when I think of all the kind of overused policy maker metaphors, uh, that are bandied about constantly. Um, the, the sort of shorthand in my mind to think about this is that it, it's not that we believe, you know, Kenya's turned a corner here. It's more about sort of a door that didn't close, right? They didn't close the door to, to be able uh, to move forward and really realize the tremendous potential of a truly amazing country. Uh, but there's a lot of work yet to be done. Um, and so I, I, I want to make sure that other people have a chance to speak and there's a chance for some uh, exchange. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. Uh, we're going to turn to our respondents on the panel. We're, uh, I won't go into introducing you again since you've already spoken at uh, some point today. But first, uh, David and Dee, who I think will talk a little bit about um, the political engagement and perhaps some of the technical issues going forward in that complicated process of devolution, but we'll see what he has to say. <laughs> we have um, Kennedy Masime uh, from ELOG who will talk, uh, I think, about uh, U.S. engagement in civil society and pr particularly perhaps uh, with a view to the uh, forthcoming elections. And then Joel Barkin, a senior associate here at CSIS, who I think is going to talk a little bit about uh, democracy promotion and how it's evolved over time in Kenya, how Kenya has changed, how our approach needs to change, mm -hmm. and what that might say about democracy uh, uh, promotion or whatever you want to call it uh, uh, in Africa more broadly. Uh, so David, let's turn to you, and I'm, I've asked our panelists to keep it very brief. It is so cold up here that uh, <laughs> we all want to get down anyway. Next time we'll have blankets up here. <laughs> David. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I mean, I, uh, this is a subject which I must confess I'm not really as comfortable <laughs> um, on, as at least have, have, a, have a strong vantage point as perhaps what I was speaking about earlier. So I think my comments are going to be uh, very much uh, uh, in the manner of uh, really a observer uh, perspective. Um, I think just reflecting on a couple of things. One is that um, I think the one of the things I think about, I mean, now looking back now into the benefit of hindsight, is uh, that uh, if you look at the historical engagement of countries like the U.S. with with, uh, with uh, African countries and uh, in particular in developing countries in general, is historically was very much uh, around economic and um, security, economic development and security, and very state-centric, of course. 
And uh, engagement on democracy and governance is very recent, only the, going back to the early 90s, certainly in our case. And uh, one cannot help and wonder whether things might have been different if, uh, in fact, uh, development and uh, democracy and governance had been at the center of the engagement from, from the beginning. I think uh, it's not really the fact that, you know, it, it, it reflects also the, the, the sort of order of things at the time that uh, I think our countries also made the mistake of uh, focusing on economic development at the expense of political development. And it's proving quite clearly that, you know, you can't really, in Africa certainly, we could really have, have gone the Asian route, <laughs> that uh, political development is perhaps much more fundamental uh, as a precursor to, to economic development. Having said that, uh, I think the U.S. has acquitted itself very well uh, in terms of uh, engaging on democracy and governance and engaging civil society, uh, very strong support, uh, very strategic interventions uh, throughout the 90s. I think there are programs. I think Joel and I can, have sort of been involved with the Parliamentary Strengthening Program, which is uh, financed by USAID and, and executed by SUNY. Uh, I'm particularly proud of that because it actually took over something which I had started. Uh, in the early 90s at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and it sort of just scaled it up. Um, the NDI support, which was being talked about here a bit earlier, you saw that, uh, how that's, and uh, Gerard can talk about that and, and various other things. Uh, besides that kind of programmatic support, I think the other thing which has been very important is uh, bold and sometimes decisive action, very risky but bold sort of diplomatic action. Uh, example which comes to mind immediately was the decision to sort of deny and publicly publicize denying visas uh, to certain high-ranking officials recently who are seen to be, and it was stated for obstructing reform. We saw shortly thereafter uh, the pipeline of, of, of corruption prosecutions which had sort of stalled, uh, open up very quickly. <laughs> and uh, you saw a lot of cases going to court. And uh, I'm told by people in that field that that had to do with uh, the Attorney General having been on that list of, of people. And uh, it sort of, it, it did. and I think that, that particular action, I believe, has acted uh, as a deterrent. Uh, to some of the people who would have been more obstructive uh, of the uh, constitutional uh, uh, sort of uh, reform uh, making process. It took the wind out of a lot of people's sails. Um, and uh, so those sort of actions, they are risky. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think uh, they, they, they have to be taken, I think, on the, on the balance that uh, it's actually been quite uh, strong. So uh, the, the question of, again, you know, supporting the process versus endorsing uh, the product uh, is, 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 I think, one which required walking a very fine line. I think on the whole, I think, uh, except for people who wanted to politicize it, uh, it was not such a big issue. Uh, I think the messaging of what, what the U.S. was supporting was quite clear. But of course, uh, you know, the problem with political propaganda, I mean, here, there, everywhere, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to actually uh, disti distinguish, uh, sort of uh, counteract people who deliberately distort uh, things very skillfully. Uh, one thing I, I want to I want to point about going forward in terms of uh, is is uh, in terms of risks and, and issues to watch about. I think in into the historically, the, the, if you look at uh, the way they support, quite frankly, uh, for for on democracy governance and particularly civil society, uh, has evolved initially, and the U.S. as well as a lot of other <laughs> development partners, in a sense. A, a, a lot of the support that went to civil society was, in fact, more of uh, an accident. It was a consequence of the deteriorating relationships with the, with the government. So they had programmed money. The government was not uh, cooperating as a partner, and a lot of the support ended up in civil society. It was not really programmed for civil society. It was uh, the fact that uh, it was a, an alternative to working with government. Uh, because historically, a lot of the institutions uh, work with government. And what we saw in, uh, in 2003, when there was a big euphoria, that uh, you had a new government, reformist government, uh, you saw a shift of focus again, uh, back, back, to, back to government. Uh, there was a shift also, not just of focus, but also of resources. And a lot of the, and civil society, that was one of the things that really took the wind out of civil society sales. Uh, and uh, it, in fact, it did also contribute uh, to the, uh, uh, even as the environment deteriorated, uh, she was at the, 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 uh, the, the support 
very much uh, the, 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 the people like the U.S. and they were not able to sort of shift, shift back the focus so that when it came to, to election, you still, in fact, <laughs> just to give an illustration, I think even the debate of whether to monitor the 2007 election, there were people who had felt that there was no need for international monitors. Uh, monitoring of the 2000 election said, oh, Kenya has really had good track record of elections. This is not whatever. Let's just focus on uh, working with the uh, government, on, on development, on health care, and all those things. So I think that, that's something I think which is important to guard against, so that there is still that kind of euphoria, yes, that maybe, again, uh, I think the lesson from that is that uh, really uh, what r the real uh, the real challenge uh, at this point in time, I think, more than uh, any other time, is uh, in terms of implementation, is uh, that it's it's going to is is deepening. It's actually deepening civil society, um, and uh, I think this is the time now to begin to think very fundamentally about sustainability of of of, of civil society. It's as I was saying, it's been the kind of support you've seen has been very episodic. Uh, and it's actually a lot of time you see it's been driven by sort of, it depends very much on how government is behaving. When, when government is behaving well, <laughs> you find that uh, the, uh, the development partner. So it, I think one needs to maintain that two-track process, yes, engaging government and doing, but also uh, looking at uh, how to um, uh, sustain and sustain up in the sort of uh, looking at uh, questions of, of deepening and, and, and strengthening and sustaining um, um, civil, civil society, particularly uh, to build the capability to drive uh, the uh, implementation uh, process and also to institutionalize, to institutionalize uh, just you know, civic sort of vigilance and, 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 and participation citizen participation in, 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 in the governance uh, of the country. So it's, it's a tall order, but I think, uh, you know, in for a penny, in for the sort of, uh, for, for, for the whole hall. Let me, let me stop. Great. Uh, thank you, um, David. Let's turn to Kennedy, who I think will also speak a bit, a bit to civil society. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I should begin by narrating uh, a story about uh, two events uh, I attended uh, in Nairobi in the past two or three years. Uh, I think the first one was the, the elections and the announcement uh, of the American elections. And the, the, the funny thing about them is that you are invited to, to report at five in the morning. <laughs> it's not always that you attend meetings at five. So we went there, and uh, at the American Embassy, there were a lot of us, from top government ministers to civil society, everybody. They know they didn't know how to mobilize the Kenyan society. I think they have a, a good uh, uh, list. We were there. You could touch the emotions. People were, I mean, uh, crammed around the screens, with their eyes misting. Most of them were crying, and uh, it was a big event. Uh, the next one was a few or two years later, and I, I believe Richard is not going to like this. It was now the British election and the subsequent announcement. <laughs> <laughs> so we were there. We also reported at five. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, <laughs> there was no connection. Uh, actually, we concentrated more on the tea and the drinks <laughs> than the actual election. Actually, people were turning their back to the screen. And it was going. It was like there was no connection. Uh, this just to illustrate uh, the Kenyans' fascinations <laughs> and expectations of the United States. In Africa, the, in the excellent setup, you know, you can report your father to the older brother, and you, you can do it directly, and they are supposed to intervene o on your behalf. Uh, increasingly, it's not the older brother, but the more successful brother. <laughs> now the power dynamics have changed, not age anymore, but uh, success, which, which goes with uh, either education or wealth. Uh, I've attended uh, the, the, some of the briefing session with the, the American ambassador, and it's more or less the same setup. When we go there as civil society, we are reporting to the, you know, the, the uncle, 
with a lot of expectations on uh, and uh, the, the father could be the government and uh, how they are treating us and everything uh the center where i work we have been uh, recipients of usid you know funds since i joined which was uh, around 2000 2001 i've seen the the evolution of, of the, the the nature i you know of uh, funding uh, initially, we used to get uh, the money directly through the Democracy and Governance Program. Uh, at some point, I think there's a bit on outsourcing now, where we, we access the money through SUNY or PAC Kenya's uh, Kenya Civil Society Strengthening Program. Like David has said, sometimes the amounts change. Uh, initially, it was good. Uh, the amounts were okay. Then it has dipped. That they are in, in uh, smaller portions, and uh, also, in, uh, like you said, following the 2003 elections, uh, there, there was that shift to government. We had these government programs, uh, the governance and justice, ju governance, justice and law program, where a lot of money went, and uh, it was like uh, civil society has done its work and uh, has outlived its usefulness. We had also some other bigger programs like uh, the public financial reform you know, strategy where a lot of money was put on the government and it was hoped that the government will behave and things will be okay. So I, want, I just want to reiterate what uh, David Ndia said that uh, there's the demand side of things and uh, there's the supply side of things. There's always need to keep a balance. If you over support the other side like the supply side of things, things don't work. Most of those programs in eventually stall, and they don't yield uh, the results, uh, intended results. So I think there's good way, uh, there's, a, there's, there's need to balance uh, that thing. Uh, Kenya has been reforming gradually. People always say it's, it's been evolutionary. I think this is the first time that uh, there's a bit of a revolution, though it's a revolution during peacetime, like some people say. There's a lot that needs to be undertaken in terms of governance reforms. Perhaps we'll just go uh, through the list that I, say, I, I, I gave in the morning uh, uh, in terms of the work that civil society needs to do. The civic and voter education is uh, facilitating public participation. I can even talk of publics. But you can talk of, uh, I mean, educating people on how to, 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 to you know, act as members of political parties. You can educate county people on how to interact with their new structures. You can educate women on how to take advantage of, you know, some of those affirmative action seats or the advantages that uh, they have received through the constitution, ETC. So it's a lot of work. You can support legislative and institutional and, uh, institutional and uh, administrative reforms. And when we talk of legislative, uh, at least the center I work for, we worked on a number of laws uh, uh, back in the, the 90s. Uh, early 2000s, uh, we supported through a member, uh, through a private member, the, 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 the law that created the Parliamentary Service Commission, and also the law that uh, the, the Political Parties Act. The Political Parties Act, for instance, took us about eight years with a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of pushing. The, 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 the law is, as it is now, is not even perfect. It takes a lot of time, a lot of resources, and a lot of energy. To, to, to push for a law and get it right. By the time you, there is an equilibrium between the law and reality, it's a lot of work. Here is a situation where we are supposed to do, the, the, people talk of 49 because of the, the, the listing in, 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 in the, 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 is it the sixth or fifth schedule. Uh, the 49th item is actually any, it says any other law that, that is contradicting the constitution. So the, the listing is not 49, they could be less because some of them can be done once. But if you look at the body of the constitution, it also anticipates a number of laws. When the constitution says that uh, there will be freedom of you know, uh, information, it requires a law to, gi to, to give it effect. So it's a lot of work that needs to go into operationalizing that constitution, and uh, civil society will need support. There are aspects of uh, conflict resolution, uh, resolution uh, technical assistance, capacity building, uh, all these requires to be done by civil society, and it will take a lot of resources. We appreciate 
the assistance that uh, the US through USID and these other agencies have been giving civil society. The only thing is that, uh, I mean, it's good, but how is it what is structured? There's a difference between funding development and by development, the, 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 the development uh, uh, civil society where you, you know, you go build schools, sink bowls, it's very direct and you can program it and say we'll sink bowls, I mean 20 bowls in two years and you, 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 you can determine what time it takes to do a bowl and how to do it. But governance, political and legislative reforms are different in ball game altogether. Uh, it's in my experience, not amenable to project, you know, uh, funding or arrangements where you say, and you, you have to write it up front, that we'll be doing ABCD for three years. Uh, it will cost this money. It doesn't work like that in reality. So in terms of project funding, and especially in the context of the new constitution, I think uh, we should think, uh, I mean, deeply about how we structure funding so that it's relevant uh, and it does not actually undermine the work that it, it's intended to do. So what I can say is that uh, funding is good. Uh, we, we, we can feel the, the, the weight of the American, uh, you know, uh, funding is really now uh, following the promulgation of the new constitution. Uh, our only worry is that it should be structured properly so that you can achieve impact. Thank you. Thank you. Let's turn to Joel. And if, the, uh, if David and Kennedy, or David, you could turn off your mic. I'll try to be uh, relatively succinct, but I want to do so in the context of the whole enterprise of democratization and democracy promotion uh, generally. The United States has been involved in democracy promotion since the mid-1980s, beginning in Latin America. In Africa, it's essentially an exercise that began in the early 90s, and Kenya has been a focus of it more or less on a sustained basis, therefore, um, for almost 18 years. Uh, what have we learned? Because while the referendum and the run-up to it and its successful conclusion uh, certainly makes us all feel very warm inside, and rightfully so, um, nonetheless, uh, our interventions on behalf of the democratization process in Kenya have not always uh, been so sophisticated and, and sustained, and there are some broader takeaways to, 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 uh, to pay attention to. The first of all is that it's a long process. It's taken 20 years. It's two steps forward, and in some cases, particularly in the early uh, stages of the struggle, arguably one and three quarters uh, steps back. It's torturous, and, because, and it's a struggle. And let's uh, make no bones about it. It's a political struggle between those who want to retain power and those who want to come into power, to some extent, for their, obviously, for their own interests, but also a reform coalition, which is not always composed only of reformers. There are uh, strange bedfellows, let's put it this way, uh, along the way. And it leads to very mixed results. The United States entered this in the early 90s very forcefully to drive the first multi-party election in Kenya. And the first lesson, quite obviously, was uh, that the employment of conditionality and the assistance to civil society uh, does not necessarily lead to an alternation of government. That occurred in 2002 when then as now, there were tremendously high expectations that the corner had been turned, and I think it was Michelle, you said the door was really opened as opposed to the, the, the corner ha had been turned. And we also shifted gears at that point in time from simply assistance for free and fair elections to the building of institutions of countervailing uh, power. And here's where I think the long-term effort really needs to focus on. It's below the radar screen. It often gets trumped by security interests. We have hung in there very well in Kenya. The, the Sunni program on the legislature has been mentioned as I think uh, in many ways a, uh, an amazing case study of what can be accomplished if funding 
matched with uh, very high level of expertise that the U.S. deploys in the field is maintained for a sustained, sustained period of time. It's now tw uh, 12 years. It began in 1998. It's going to continue to uh, 2014. But that kind of a cycle of a project will have crossed three administrations and multiple ambassadors. And the biggest risk, in my mind, is that the institutional memory gets frayed along the way. And when you have a turnover in personnel, uh, when the baton is passed, it's not always passed as uh, well as it should be. So where do I come down on this, and where do we go f from here? Uh, to some extent, to continue what we've been doing, because it has worked, but to keep in mind that Quite obviously, the realities, as we've heard today, um, are different than they were even a, um, before the referendum, and that there's going to be a change in administration in Kenya in, in, uh, in t uh, 2012. And as David and Dee, I thought, laid out very well, uh, the structure of politics has changed uh, fundamentally. So simply doing more of the same uh, is not necessarily the answer. Um, and we can't go to sleep at the switch, because if I'm allowed a, a personal co uh, comment, I was an observer to the 2007 election, and I felt we had gone asleep at the switch. And we committed the, uh, uh, the mistake uh, uh, that uh, Ken Nyonde mentioned this morning. We focused on personalities on the Electoral Commission and not, not institution. So we have to keep our eye on the institutional ball, even though it isn't very uh, sexy. That in turn means uh, that the whole USAID um, embassy relationship, and former Ambassador Bellamy is here at the back of the room, he knows this well, this has to be a very comfortable uh, relationship. And this in turn means that in terms of who we send out uh, to, to the field, particularly at the USAID level, whereby concerns are our greatest, that they really match and are people who can work with the, uh, the embassy and, and that we have people who really want to invest in uh, learning what has come before in order to uh, move forward. Focus on the institutional ball, that means the legislative program, although that's beginning to phase out and rightly so because the issue of sustainability has to be addressed. Do we simply do more of the same because it's worked? Or at one point, what time do you, what, when do you go home or shift uh, gears? What about civil society? Um, the last year I've been conducting a study for the National Endowment to, for Democracy on recipients of, of uh, democracy assistance. And the telling figure is globally uh, what uh, Kennedy has uh, reported this morning, and that is overwhelmingly civil society is dependent on external funding. Maybe it's time we start re-examining this demanding matching grants, even though it was, might be small, at, say at 10 percent, because to the extent that which the donors in the U.S. in particular can support uh, democratization efforts, they must have viable partners. And one demonstration of viable partners are those groups that can raise at least some measure of their own resources as to those who are just, in effect, um, uh, begging. I'd like to see uh, a continuation of, of the uh, immediate past efforts in 2012, the PVT vote, the, the mapping. You and I have talked about this before, I mean, I, it, it, it's, it's, why did it take so long for us to do this? Uh, why not an early e election? So I guess I would, I would stop there. Uh, we can congratulate ourselves, but, but we should be careful in, in, uh, in letting it go at that. I, I believe that we can still uh, uh, do better. Uh, and uh, that's going to require some, some continuing commitment, both in Nairobi and here. Great. Thanks very much to the panel. Well, let's open up for questions and comments from the floor. I wonder if any of our um, Kenyan participants from this morning might like to, um, uh, might like, might to add anything. 
uh, Faroe's on the judiciary, the police, which is a particular interest of ours. <laughs> um, Faroe's our watches. That's the first point. Yeah. The mic is coming. Without in any way uh, reducing the support to the civil society uh, and the focus that you have, some attention to the need to look at political parties, strengthening them. What is, what has to, we have to pay attention to who, how does, how do political parties recruit their, their low leadership, second, third tier leadership, etc.? A and what we are seeing is a perpetuation of, of the, the mentors are these, the people you have rejected as a focus of, of uh, interaction. That's why the large focus on civil society. But if you leave them alone, They'll recruit people who look like them. Thank you. Should we take a couple? Yes. Yeah. 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 We're talking of sustainability from the point of view of, of work in Kenya. But we need sustainability from the U.S. side. When Smith Hempston was there, the what the U.S. position did was to give legitimacy to reform. The ambassador who followed him disengaged, leaving Moy uh, an open field. Uh, these these uh, hard in hard and out. Thank you, Faroz. Questions, comments, this is your chance to. John. I wasn't planning a second bite of the apple, but I, I there's, I, I can remember a, a very stark time in, in Kenya, when I was in Kenya uh, following Joel, when the concerns about democracy and concerns about security came in direct conflict with each other. Um, and those have not diminished. I'm, I'm a democracy person, I'm not a security person, but I'm interested in how the U.S. is balancing their concern for security and thinking about the Somali threat and, and all of that with this ongoing concern for democracy. It's a classic struggle. Which took, I think, something of a hit in the, in the post 9-11 uh, phase when um, where we may be moving away from that, but um, it, it is a balance that always has to be struck. More questions here. Yes. David Brown, I'm a master's student at SICE. A question about the decision last year to revoke travel visas from government officials. Is that a, I was wondering, Michelle, maybe you could talk about the decision to use that strategy and for any of you, the sustainability of that tool going forward. Um, it seems like you think it was successful, um, but do we run too great a risk of pushing partners away? And again, uh, it gets a little bit to the question of this individuals versus institutions. And, and these folks, uh, you know, what was the process by which it was determined these particular folks, I don't know if you're, you're, you're able to answer that, but I, I think <laughs> uh, versus others, because there was a, there's plenty to choose from. Uh, <laughs> and and what, was, what was the process to, that singled it out? Was it an American process or was it a Kenyan process? And I think we, we run that too now in the, with the ICC and, and, and questions around that. Perhaps you want to uh, mention something around that as well. Um, so let's turn back to the, oh, we've got one more over here. We'll take them all and we'll, um. Yeah, um, it's a comment on uh, individual travel bans that I want to make in the light of the comment that has been made. As a Kenyan who was um, uh, in Kenya that particular time the bans were announced, um, 
I really think that that was a very legitimate intervention. Very legitimate intervention. But it had its own weaknesses. The focus was on individuals without focusing also on their families. Right? Um, in the sense that you did not complete the cycle and for it to have good impact, we really insist, and this is the message we have been really speaking hard about, you must have a focus on their own families, spouses and children who are in US standing here. That's the only way of weakening their sense of impunity. That's the way of undermining their efforts to frustrate reforms at home. And only when you do that, that's when you, you, they become sensitive to the things that they do at home. Uh, going back to the question of um, continuity that Firoz has talked about, I think there is need to emphasize the significance of having, for lack of a better word, of having ambassadors who fully understand Kenya and who are very committed to embedding the discourse of reforms at every level. Um, he's talked about disengagements at some, some, some particular time and others, but we need that consistency. We need that consistency for one reason, that governments are very sensitive to how you engage. And if you come with silence diplomacy, and bedroom, I mean, and the dining dip diplomacy, that's not the language impun people who, who prefer impunity understand best. So if there is going to be any transition and change in Kenya, let that one be a transition that will lead to getting someone who fully understands Kenya, someone who is uh, uh, going to play a critical role in trying to ensure that uh, reforms are fully uh, implemented. We are moving towards a very difficult phase of implementing the constitution. This is the most hard part of the reform building agenda in Kenya now. And the frustrations will come at different levels. And getting someone who understands it and put, making sure that the government understands that it's under watch. And various individuals are under watch is very critical. Um, but the fi my final point is, I, I think this idea of saying let's dis uh, disconnect individuals from institutions is an issue that we need to pay much more attention very seriously because there is no significant difference between the agency and the structure under some circumstances. Uh, and therefore, getting to know that the actors could be as bad as, I mean, can make institutions bad is also important. So let's try to see how we can balance the two. I have a very quick question um, regarding the inability of civil society to gather funds um, domestically independent of foreign funders. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the reasons behind that inability or lack of desire to gather funds on their own and the types of support and or um, sanctions or, or, or force that you would use on civil society to make them um, gather funds on their own. Thank you, from, from Stick to Carrot. Um, uh, very briefly, to emphasize the importance of assistance to the electoral process, Kenya faces two massive challenges simultaneously, and they are, of course, related. Implementation of the Constitution on the one hand, and preparing, hopefully, for a successful election as early as August 2012 on the other. And these have to happen simultaneously, and the sequencing of that is going to be very challenging as well. Um, one of the things that came out of the Krieger Report was the importance of sustaining all assistance to the electoral process through the election cycle. And I'm not just talking about support for, for Elog and Kennedy, but support for the Election Commission and others. Um, how important that is, because historically Kenya has suffered from feast and famine. Because we can use this time to respond and kind of wrap up as well. Why don't we start with you, and we'll sure. come back to you at the end for any uh, final thoughts. OK. Well, thank you. That was a, um, a good mix of, of good questions and good advice, uh, which uh, I'm happy to take on board, um, and some, some excellent points. I guess uh, just trying to work through some of these, um, some of these issues, I, 
uh, certainly take the point on uh, the importance of political parties and You know, for, for I think for Kenya to kind of realize this potential that everyone talks about, one one has to see a, a change uh, in the um, the nature of political parties in in, in Kenya. The, <laughs> they're sort of ever you know, right now they're kind of these amorphous, um, uh, ever shifting uh, entities uh, that have uh, unfortunately uh, historically and and still I think it's fair to say more to do with um, uh, sort of identity politics than, uh, than with political platforms. I, I do, so I, I hear what you're saying. I, I do think that um, particularly engaging with young people is a big part of uh, getting at that issue. And that, that's, gonna, that's not something that's going to change uh, immediately. Uh, it, you have to kind of create a different politics to have political party structures that reflect it. Um, and creating a different politics is a Kenyan enterprise. It's not a, a U.S. enterprise uh, for Kenyans, but we certainly uh, can try and be supportive uh, in in ways that are uh, uh, effective and not naive <laughs> about the nature of political party structure. So I think it's a it's a great point. Um, also on kind of the waxing and waning of U.S. policy and attention to some of these issues and the importance of getting the right uh, people on the ground. And, and Joel spoke to the importance of the AID mission director, obviously the importance of having strong ambassadors, like Ambassador Bellamy, it's just great to see you. Uh, you know, the US political system is what it is. Um, and so if there are changing administration priorities from one to another, then it's the, it's the job of uh, an ambassador to reflect the, the priorities of, of the president and the administration. Uh, so there, there are always going to be some constraints on our consistency uh, writ large. But I do think that there isn't a whole lot of disagreement about Kenya's importance. I don't think anyone, uh, there, there's nothing partisan about saying that Kenya is a, a tremendously uh, important partner to the U.S. And, and I, I do think there's a, a, a widespread consensus on how uh, critical reform is in the Kenyan political system uh, to Kenya's stability. So I, I you know, I'm hopeful <laughs> that moving forward, you know, beyond the days of, of uh, the administration uh, that I work for um, and out, you know, into uh, the, the kind of out years uh, that, that we would have that. But uh, I, I just would point out there are always, there are always constraints. I certainly think it's not going to change anytime soon that this is seen as an incredibly important and sensitive post um, and one where we, uh, we need to be uh, uh, putting uh, excellent uh, personnel and ensuring that they work together effectively. Uh, tensions between democracy and security and how to reconcile them. Well, that's sort of the subject, I think, for if not another panel, another kind of week-long uh, symposium. But it's a, uh, yes, I do think these tensions sometimes manifest themselves in Kenya just as they do here. Uh, I also think that it's, it's very clear to us uh, within the administration that we're not, <laughs> uh, our, our uh, investment in having a, a strong uh, partner on security issues in Kenya is utterly lost if the, the country finds itself uh, in conflict. And, uh, and uh, you know, these are the kinds of very, very stark uh, potentialities that, that people were focused on in, during that post-election violence. So in some ways, that lesson has helped guide our thinking that we need to be focused on the long term here. You, you have a much stronger partner in addressing critical security issues if you have uh, a one that's not kind of shaky at its found, very foundations. And so I you know, fundamentally and in the long term, I don't think these things are in tension in, in any way. I think they're, um, they're very much complementary. You know, in terms of specific issues where sometimes you might have a security imperative that uh, domestically we might have a security imperative that might lead us down one track and a set of concerns around um, civil liberties that might be in tension with that. It, it, you know, I think that happens in other societies as well. And, uh, it's our job to keep our eye on the ball, uh, understand that uh, 
Uh, these are ultimately decisions that will be managed by, by Kenyans, but to keep that focus on the importance of having a, a strong and resilient partner, and that means uh, uh, making sure that we get the governance piece right. Uh, on visa bans um, and targeted, targeted sorts of sanctions, uh, you know, I'm not going to kind of speak to that, the kind of information uh, that necessarily informed some of the specific decisions because uh, it's not appropriate here. But what I would say is that um, uh, it was very important, I think, from the get-go uh, to make plain that this message we were sending, no business as usual, um, was not purely a rhetorical message. Uh, there was a sense that there was um, perhaps too much comfort in some circles that crisis had passed and we can all sort of go back to the same uh, kinds of relationships um, that one had seen before. And so I think that that was uh, an important part of sending that signal. But what I would say about that kind of tool and deploying that kind of tool in a case like Kenya is that in isolation, I think it would have been utterly ineffective, right? If, if basically your policy focuses on what you have to complain about, um, and you're not doing much on the side of what are you trying to build, um, I think the, the sort of net result of that is making ourselves perhaps feel good and, and not a whole uh, heck of a lot more. I think that, you know, as a, a part of an approach that is uh, much more uh, encompassing and, uh, and thought out and carefully sequenced where you're trying to send uh, one signal here while you're providing some support uh, for the, the change agents elsewhere, then, then I think it can be uh, quite effective. And certainly it's interesting because I've, I've, I've heard complaints about this absolutely across the spectrum, this incredibly heavy-handed and inappropriate and set back efforts that it wasn't strong enough um, and didn't actually bite because you should have gone much further. And so uh, I, I, I listen to it all. It's, um, it's helpful guidance and I, I just, I think the most important thing to say about that is I think that, that tools like that can be very effective, but very rarely are they effective in a vacuum. On accountability, <clears throat> this is a, an incredibly important piece, one that um, all senior USG officials have spoken to and they've spoken publicly about uh, Kenya, and I think that it's very hard to see uh, how Kenya kind of definitively enters a new era in its politics if you don't have any kind of accountability whatsoever for orchestrating uh, the sort of violence that we saw in the post-election period. It's just not, uh, it's not a viable uh, way to proceed. And so, again, these are, uh, you know, we, we can't want this more than the Kenyan people. It's a, it's a, Kenyan, uh, a Kenyan issue, but our position has been crystal clear from the beginning and it's not going to change. Uh, on Let's see, I'm going to let somebody else speak to civil society's efforts to uh, get more support and financial support domestically, uh, but on the importance of assistance to the electoral process, it's an excellent point, and it would be, uh, <laughs> it would be absolutely tragic, actually, if we'd uh, moved out as aggressively we have on, on trying to help uh, see that trajectory in Kenya tick up, upward on the governance side. Uh, and drop the ball on the electoral process. So I, I take it on board, I, and I have a set of questions I want to go back and ask my colleagues and make sure that we're uh, in the right place. Thank you. I have quick uh, wrap-up remarks from the, uh, the, the remainder of our panel. Okay, quickly, uh, I will speak to this, some civil society issues, and I think uh, just perspective, I'm sure my colleagues will also give uh, some perspectives to reinforce that. I think on the question of supporting civil society, I think a satisfactory model is, what's a satisfactory model? I think that, that's a difficult question. I, I just give my own perspectives uh, 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 that really what my colleague was saying about the project approach uh, is really, well, because that, that's, that's absolutely the wrong way to, to look at supporting civil society for two reasons. I, I think to, I'll, I'll highlight two reasons. One is that first of all, I mean, in a, demo, in a democratic process, civil society is an end in itself. The, its existence is one of the objectives. So if you look at the project, and I think that's what's been happening, because of the perspective of looking at it as a project, so you say, you know, and the people in the development, having people from a development, economic development uh, doing this, is, you know, you do an economic development project and it's finished, and you move on. And you don't see as at the purpose of civil society is actually 
an existential thing that you're trying to ensure that it's always there. Uh, we say in democracy, in time of uh, vigilance, it must be eternal. So that's one of the perspectives. They look at look at the fact that it's really seeing the existence and civil, of an active, robust, sort of vibrant civil society is one of the ends, not something that you want to remember and then say, oh, oh, we have had a clean, a good referendum, so you know you don't need civil society for now until you know next time. The second one, which I think is a very oft missed dimension, uh, for me is very important because I've witnessed it happening a lot, is that uh, civil society in societies like ours. Uh, has a, another sort of spin-off, which is leadership development. Really, if you look at civil society, really is, is the incubation of, 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 of an alternative leadership. Because remember, the, the situation you're coming from is one where the leadership culture that you have in the public realm is not what you want. So people who are being socialized in that uh, system are not the ones you want to be, the leaders or, or the new whatever. So where are the sort of alternative leadership? Uh, for the new sort of dispensation are going to come from the other people who are sort of uh, in, uh, socialized uh, in civil society. And I mean, uh, countless personal examples. I mean, my, my last uh, PA, my research assist, my last personal assist, research assistant is now the director of governance in the government. And she sort of uh, five, six years ago, she was just my research assistant. And she's a director of governance and treasury. And there are many countless individuals you can see who uh, are coming out into government, bringing that different sort of uh, culture. And that, again, is an output which is often missed, that uh, the supporting civil society is, is contributing. Because there is no other platform, there's no other forum where people can acquire the sort of kind of values and, and whatever that, that you want for uh, in open society and democratic governance. David? I think we're going to... Yeah, just, just one final point on, on, on domestic funding. <laughs> okay. Why The issue yeah, yeah. of domestic funding. Why is there not uh, domestic... Uh, what's the problem with domestic funding? There is actually a domestically funded finance civil society, uh, especially interest groups. You know, if you look at the NCCK, the church type of interest groups are predominantly uh, domestically financed. The foreign dependent civil society is what I call the intellectual civil society, especially the think tanks, the uh, governance NGOs, and those type of institutions. And why is that? It's basically because uh, you don't have the private wealth uh, in countries like Kenya, which supports those kind of institutions uh, in a country like this. You don't have George Soros and people like that. Uh, so I think it's inevitable that for a long time, that's going to have to be uh, externally or funded from other sources until you sort of develop uh, the sort of uh, the private, private, private wealth that uh, can sort of philanthropy that, that can support that sector. Thanks. Uh, just quickly to Kennedy and then Joel. So much for Okay, thank you very much on uh, the ability of uh, civil society to gather resources locally. I mean, wh what are the possible sources? One could be the, the population. Uh, I've been to the, the UK where I attended two buses where a student, is it buses? I know English is not my language. Uh, where a student you know, they, they say you get in with uh, three pounds, two pounds, and they get the money for people like ActionAid and uh, Oxford. Unfortunately, this cannot happen in Kenya because of decades of you know, patronage. Nowadays, we are coming from a country where, you know, people demand, is it sitting and now standing allowance <laughs> for attending a rally? The, the, the dependency in our country is so much. But it, didn't, it was not like that before. Those who have read our history know what used to happen. Pioneer civil societies like the Kuyu Central Association used to get monies of their own and take people like Kenyatta, you know, just villagers selling ch chicken and small monies and pulling it together and sending a delegation to London or take, taking food for, for further education. Uh, that initiative has been abused by patronage, where now elites used to come. We, in the 80s, when it was bad, you used to have people, I mean, you have organize a, a fundraiser, and an individual, just one individual come and will give the whole entire amount and advise you to keep your money and go and use it somewhere else. So they have removed the initiative from the population. It's very difficult to get money from the population. The other one would be private sector. But issues of corruption and uh, where we are coming from, I mean, why would someone pro I mean, uh, support civil society around that abstract issue that, that, that doesn't make sense to you? If you want something changed, you go to see a minister with a briefcase and it will be done. So you, 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 you invest wisely, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> the other alternative would be government, because I know your governments give funding to civil society. I mean, it's inconceivable that that will happen in Kenya in the near future. 
unless maybe you force their hand. So, but there are, there are options, which most of them are also, could not also be at, uh, attractive. Uh, civil society like the Center for Governance and Development, I mean, we have the capacity to do consultancies. Uh, we can also do service provision, but that also comes with the, you know, conflict of interest eh, challenges. Uh, it also, uh, and when advocacy is one of your agenda, it's also difficult. I mean, you do consultancy for government, then the next time when you want to something done, well, what do you do? So there are challenges on that. And uh, the final point I want to make, and it ties with uh, what Dr. Uh, Bakan uh, said, was that I think there's room within even the external funding that we have to build institutions, and, and I think he put it so well, for the long term. Poli donor policies are around funding for civil society like now. You have a sense they are, I mean, what do you call it? Designed to perpetuate, you know, dependency. I think there's room, things like rental premises. I think there could be room. Uh, why would you pay rent for an organization for 20 years and you cannot allow them to get a mortgage? And you spend the money anyway. Why can't it be structured in a way that can, I mean, g give them some independence in the medium and long term? Issues like endowment. Why don't you structure the finding so that they can build endowment? That they can see, you have to begin from somewhere. So some of those policies can be changed. I mean, we are building institutions and the institutions for the long term. Let's structure the funding in such a, a way that uh, we foresee a situation where the partner will, you know, stand on their two legs and walk at some point and uh, survive without us. Or if they are supposed to get something from us that is minimal. Thank you very much. Okay. 30 seconds. 30, 30 seconds. Uh, I'll make it three points instead of uh, four since uh, civil society has already been discussed. A little quieter diplomacy, um, particularly within Kenya, uh, might be the best way to go from here on out. That is to say, uh, certainly once it's clear where the U.S. stands by the statement of the president, the interview he gave with KBC and Vice President Biden, uh, but after that, we've had a very peripatetic ambassador who seems to be everywhere. And uh, I don't know. I'll let the Kenyans uh, respond to, to that. Um, secondly, political parties. I'm sorry, Neroz, uh, uh, Feroz, I disagree with you. The research shows, frankly, that in terms of the development of the legislature, strong disciplined parties actually complicate it. And until there are programmatic-based uh, political parties in Africa, which is generally not the pattern now, it's extremely difficult for the donors to get involved in, the, in this thicket. They've tried, they get burnt. Uh, I won't elaborate all the, the ins and out of this. It's just very difficult to do given you know, the limited time and, and, and resources. I would focus more on state institutions, and that brings me around finally to the Electoral Commission and the, and the the election of 2012. Uh, I'll endorse what Mary said. Uh, we need uh, to uh, start now. Uh, we need to be clear who the viable partners are in this period of transition from the interim election commission and also from the boundary commission because there's this whole issue on the constituencies, how they're going to be drawn, and uh, the, uh, how the boundaries of the counties are, dr are drawn. And frankly, we have uh, some useful technical skills here that can be brought to bear, but the dialogue has to be begin uh, now. And um, you know, IFAS, NDI have a lot of uh, capacity uh, here because as many of you know who are in this room, uh, most of what we do in this, this area, we rely on contractors for better or worse, and, and uh, that requires some lead times. Listen, I want to thank our speakers very much. I mean, what I'm getting out of this is focus on the elections. Begin focusing now. Focus on institutions uh, rather than individuals. There are going to be new institutions created and new institutional relationships, a new relationship between the executive and the legislator. What does that say for our engagement with the legislator? This devolution uh, brings up all kinds of issues about capacity, about oversight at a local level, which also says something about civil society's need to kind of deepen to the local level uh, to provide mechanisms of oversight there. And really using our voice um, strategically um, at, at key moments of opportunity. 
I think we've done uh, we've, we've done a really a, a, it's been a remarkable um, past year for U, for U.S. engagement in Kenya, especially as I said at the outset, given everything else that's going on, um, and uh, 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 I, I think at least for in this administration, I think that's that's very likely to continue. Uh, particularly with an advocate and a champion for this uh, in uh, the person of Michelle. Um, so I want to thank again all our panelists, our, uh, our audience for being with us today and, and uh, the full day. It's been a terrific set of discussions. And we're hoping to write up a summary of this and then audio, if you want to go back and listen to this again and again, uh, is, will be on our website. <laughs> okay. Thank you.